Okay, so today we're talking about Office Admin in Music Studios, and I would love to hear your experiences with that, whether there's certain issues that you come up with again and again, whether there's certain areas where you think you're doing a really great job and really efficient with your Office Admin. We're going to talk about some of the main areas where I think teachers spend a lot of time and some of the ways I work on those to help streamline them as much as we can, as much as I can but I'm open to your input as well. If you have a question throughout today's show, just start with the word question so I can make sure to come back to all of those at the end and they can be about anything at all. So don't worry if it's a bit off topic, that's no problem whatsoever. So admin, your issues and concerns are coming in already, which is great. Serene's the biggest time suck would have to be travel. That we can't do anything about because we don't have a teleportation device, right? You tried to do some admin on the on the move. Maya said lesson notes, right, are the biggest time suck. Um, and reschedules, although she also said I'm about to eliminate those. So <laughs> that's good news because that will save you a lot of pain and headaches. Uh, Jennifer said marking theory assignments, reminding parents how to cancel lesson attendance, and right now making spreadsheets to add to Vivid practice. Um, Rachel said, probably making social media posts. Really? That's interesting. Okay. And let me see. Making lesson notes without interrupting the lesson itself. Okay. Try doing it at the end of the day, but I'm frazzled by that point. Yeah, I get that. Absolutely. Um, fantastic. Okay. So let me know what yours are. And I'll, I'm going to go through some of my areas where I feel we spend a lot of time and how they save time. So the first area I thought of with this is registration forms. And it's not actually because they take a lot of time from a lot of teachers. Some teachers have registration forms. Some of you may not. Let me know in the chat whether you do registration forms, enrollment forms, whatever you call them, or you don't. I do. And they don't take an enormous amount of time, but what they do is save time because registration forms streamline a whole lot of things, okay? So I have mine done digitally. So they're in a, I use a WordPress plugin on my site. You could use Google Forms or anything you like to do it quite simply. But the magic of that, of them being digital, is I can then download that when it comes to a new year or I have new students joining us. And I have then a spreadsheet of all of their information. So student's name, their surname, parent's phone number and email and their name and their address and all of that stuff is in a spreadsheet. And that saves an enormous amount of time. Also formalizing it as a registration process saves me big time from where I used to be. So I used to, well, way back when, when I first started teaching, I would just like text the parents, I think probably, <laughs> and set up the lesson time. And that was it. There was no formal agreement. And it worked fine. You know, I only had a few students. I was a teenager, whatever. But having a registration form means that all of that information comes in one spot. It also means because I attach that to the registration fee, it means that in July, I know who is definitely coming back. And that is so important. So having that attached to a fee actually makes the parents take it more seriously, I believe. And so they tend to come back to me on time. If they're late, that's a different story. We'll <laughs> deal with that in a second. But if they're late, they might lose their spot in the studio and they're definitely not going to get um, timetabling preference because as soon as that deadline is up, like a couple of days later, they do have a bit of a grace period, but a couple of days after that is when I start to make the timetable. So if I don't have their scheduling information and if I don't know they're coming back for sure, then I'm not putting them in the timetable in that first go. Now, if there's spots left over and then they come back to me late and say, please, can we still sign up? Fine, but they're going to be left with what they're left with, right? I'm not going to move around the other students. So that's part of how the registration forms help. 
And connected to that is the fact that on the registration forms, I ask for their scheduling preferences. So I ask them to cross out all the times that will not work for them. I've talked about this many times, but that way around is better than please tell me all the times that will work for you because parents tend to see that and just choose one. They don't give you all the times that will work. They give you one time that'll work. And if you say, tell me all the times that won't work, they tend to be more honest about that (laughs) and actually leave you with all their availability, which makes the timetabling possible for me, right? So um, yeah, that's how I kind of streamline all of that to send out this registration form. It's on a digital page. It's on a page on my website. You can use Google Forms like Debbie is using and it goes straight into a spreadsheet. Um, which is another great option. But you then have that link. You can update it the next year and then just send it out again or make a copy of your Google form if you're using that and send out the new one. And that way, yes, it can go straight into a spreadsheet from Google Forms. Um, the, The reason I don't have the Google Forms thing, well, one of the reasons is because I want the fee attached to that form. So meaning they cannot send me the form without paying the fee and they can't send me the fee without filling in the form. Because when I had paper forms, I would get both of those happening, even though I said they had to like clip a check or cash to the the form and give it to me, they would still sometimes not, or they would give me just the money because they thought that was the important part rather than the form, but the form is what I want. I want the money to show you really mean what's on the form and I want the form. (laughs) That's what my priority is more than the money. Not that we don't need the money to run the business and stuff, but I really just want that timetabling info. And the registration fee being attached to that means that they don't just fill it out and not really think about it and give it to me because they're putting money behind it. So yeah. Oh yeah. Jennifer, it makes a huge difference. Do try it. Huge, huge difference. Um, so Denise asked, how do we figure out the registration fee? Never used a registration fee, a registration form, but think it may be valuable. Okay, so my registration fee, I sometimes call it a registration and materials fee. Basically what it is, is roughly the amount that I would spend on materials for each student for the whole year. Now that's an average and I'm not like deducting each expense from their account or anything like that. My studio is a all-inclusive model. So the fees that they pay, the registration fee plus the regular fees, all of that, they're never asked for any other money for anything ever except an exam fee because those are completely separate and optional and very expensive. (laughs) So um, yeah, like the folder that I give them and their piano bag and all the books they use during the year and our games we print, all of that stuff is what I'm trying to cover with the registration fee. So when I first brought it in, I worked out the average um, that of number of books and stuff like that, that students would go through. And then that became my registration fee and it's gone up since, but yeah, that's basic idea. So even if you just, even if you don't want to do that, just splitting off some of your regular fees, like let's say you do monthly payments, you could just take the last month or the first month and make it due before they start, right? It's like if you do, well, I'm not sure if that's universal. Maybe folks in different countries can tell me, but it would be common to ask for the first and last month's rent when you start renting a property, a house or flat. Um, You would be asked for the first and last month's rent um, so that the last month you don't actually pay that rent because it's kind of a deposit. So, I mean, there's different ways to do it, but having some kind of a fee attached to that, even if it's a nominal amount, it will make people actually think it through, I find. So that's registration forms. They save me a whole lot of headaches and make everything make sense, especially the bigger your studio gets. But even if you have a small studio, it can save you a huge amount of headaches. Okay, then it comes to scheduling and the calendar. And this is a big one for many teachers. I'm surprised it hasn't come up that much in the chat so far. Let me know if you hate scheduling. A teacher at the Alberta conference that I was just at um, put up her hand in one part 
and asked about scheduling and said it was the least, her least favourite part of her job. Or she might have said of my year, I don't know. But I often think of it as the least favourite part of my year. Is that like two weeks in July basically where I have to work out the schedule. <laughs> and mine is a particular brand of nightmare because I have all these different lesson formats. And they're important to me and, you know, the studio is the way it is because I want it to be. So I suck it up and I deal with our scheduling and how interesting that is. But um, yeah, it's, it's not easy. So I'll tell you how I handle scheduling and then I'll tell you an alternative if you want to make it way easier than mine is. So the way I do it is I set up a Google Sheet and each row is like five minutes. I have a sample of this um, in the membership if anyone wants to see it, but each row is five minutes and then the days of the week go across the column. So it's Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, because we teach on Saturdays. And then down the side, it starts at 2 p.m. because that's the earliest we would ever start. So 2 p.m. and then five minute increments from there. And what I'm doing is I'm arranging students in blocks of the time they take up in, a, in the schedule. So if they have a 45 minute lesson, it's that many rows merged together. This all makes more sense if you look at the timetable that's on the sample timetable, sorry. That's not the main topic of today, but just to give you an idea. And then I have that open on one screen and I have the scheduling preferences in my spreadsheet from the registration form open in another screen. And then I start moving people around and trying to make it make sense, which takes a while. It is a puzzle. It's not easy. Now, if you hate that, <laughs> And you don't have a super complicated studio where students are paired up in different ways and some students are taking lessons at their own home and all of the stuff that I do, then you could let people pick their own spots. Like if everyone takes 45 minute lessons or everyone takes 30 minute lessons, you could let people sign up on a first come first serve basis. And the way you could do this, there's, I mean, there's many ways, but one way you could do it is using my music staff. So you could open up the time slots you have available in your schedule, leaving breaks for yourself, and then let people know that it's open, maybe giving them advanced warning a few days in advance. Hey, on Wednesday at this time, I'm going to be put, opening up the schedule. Slots will be given out on a first come, first serve basis. Like you could put this totally in parents' hands if that's what you want to do. I would just caution you if you do have multiple lesson lengths, if you have any group lessons, you know, it's a lot more complicated then because you want that control to make sure people go in a slot that actually works for them, not just for their timing, right? So, but that is one option. Let me know how you do schedules in the chat. Let me know how you handle it, whether you found a magic cure for your studio. But for most of us, there's not a magic cure, but having that registration form with as much time open for each student as you can get by getting them to opt out of times rather than in, it makes a huge difference. And it's the reason I'm able to do the schedule at all. If I let them circle the times that will work, for example, um, I wouldn't have any options. And I'd spend my whole summer going back and forth with parents. Like that's what would happen. Because if I don't have, if I'm not able to move people by myself, like I have to go to each individual parent and say, oh, t we don't have 3 p.m. on Thursdays. Could you possibly do any time on Wednesday? And like having the, oh my God, what a nightmare, right? <laughs> so that does save me an enormous amount of time. Now, the other thing that saves me time that also comes from the registration form in my day-to-day -day is my student info sheet. So this is incredibly simple. It's not fancy but it does save me a lot, a lot of annoyance and time. So my student info sheet is simply a spreadsheet. I do mine in Google Sheets and it has everything that was on the registration form, but it also has some extra details. Like if I know the instrument they have at home, that'll be in there. It'll have their lesson day in there so that I can filter by that. Um, It'll have the book that they're, book or books that they're in at the moment, so I can keep an eye on what books we might need next. For example, if I see that, okay, 10 different kids are in Piano Safari 2, 
I know that at some point we might need piano safari three for those. That's just a simple example. Um, yeah, and it just has all the information I could ever want about them, basically, including their birthday and then a column which automatically works out their age from their birthday. It has this date they started lessons and a column that works out how long it's been since that date. So, like, I can quickly see if they've been in lessons for six years or one or whatever. All of these things we have some idea of in our head, right? We roughly know our students' ages. We roughly know how long they've been taking lessons. But being able to see at a glance... Oh, they're in this class in school. Some of you might say this grade in school, right? Or this year for us. Um, this is where they are in school. This is how long they've been taking lessons. And it helps you just check things like that really quickly. It also means I can filter anything I want. So say I select, you know, I filter by the day of the week they take lesson because I have to email everyone that has a lesson on Thursday for some reason. It's easy and quick to do that. So just having it all in one spot and making sure that stays updated. Like that's my primary source for everything. And that has to stay updated. Now, a lot of this information is also in my music staff. But for how quickly I can move around and stuff, for a lot of things, I'm using that sheet. Other things I might be using my music staff. It depends on the circumstance. But I like to have the sheet where I can see everything at a glance. Um, so, yeah. That saves me an enormous amount of work. Um, about scheduling, Denise said, this year was easy and families took this their time as last year, same time as last year. Only a couple had to move. This probably won't be a yearly thing. Look, I know some teachers who do that every year. They say, everyone keeps their same time. Like, we're not moving. The reason I hit the refresh button every summer is because if I have two students that need to move, let's say two kids move from primary school to secondary school, okay? And they're t opposite, like they can't swap with each other because both of them need a later time. That's what happens primary school to secondary school here is you finish later in the day. So what am I going to do? If no one else wants to move, what am I going to do with them? And it's not their fault that they got older and went to a, another school. So that's kind of how I see it. I think the only way for me to handle it, because so, enough students need to move, I have to be have everyone open to moving. Some will end up with the same spot as last year, but I need that flexibility to make it work for everyone. And I always somehow do. We always somehow find a slot for everyone that gets the registration forms in on time. Yeah, top three and time slots. Yeah, I'm glad you enjoy it. That's great. Um, yeah, the top three gives you some flexibility. For me, it's just better to have as much flexibility as I can. And having them opt out of certain times gives me that. Is there a formula I have to know for figuring out ages and years and lessons? You mean in a spreadsheet? Yeah, it's pretty simple to do. It depends which program you're using, but it's basically the dated if function in, Mo in Excel, Google Sheets, whatever. So if you Google that for whatever you're using, um, or even look up how to work out someone's birthday, it's a pretty simple formula. It's dated if today, and then the cell. Yeah, that's basically how it works. And then the other one, I actually have it do it years and months. So it'll be like three years, two months since they started. So yeah, both of them are pretty simple to set up. And you only have to do it once. Hence, I'm not going to remember the exact formula for you because you only set it up once and then you just leave it there forever. Yes, I do manually create that spreadsheet. But when I download all my registration form data, that's in a separate spreadsheet. So I'm, I'm copying a lot of this across. It doesn't take long to update every year. And um, so a lot of it stays there and then Obviously, yeah, some elements will change. Uh, I make sure that their address is still up to date. I make sure the phone numbers are still what they want. Um, also, what's in there is like, do they want semesterly or monthly payments? The type of lessons they're taking, all of that stuff. So that when we're setting up invoices, that's all in one spot as well. So yeah, basically it's manual, but it's a lot of copy and pasting. Doesn't take me that long to update it. Okay, so... Next area that you could save some time, I think this is one fewer teachers will be doing, and that is emails. Who spends a lot of time in their email? 
So I have some automatic emails sent up. So I've set, I've set up, I mean, I've set up a MailerLite account for my studio. MailerLite is a free email marketing platform. Uh, that's the main reason I use it. There's nothing particularly special about it. If you're using a different free one, go for it. But MailerLite is free for up to a certain number of subscribers and most studios won't go anywhere near that minimum number, like, the, sorry, the maximum number with the free account. So yeah, it's a great option. I have that set up so that I can send out studio-wide emails about, you know, upcoming concerts, whatever. And also so that I can set up automatic emails. Because a question that may be on your mind is, oh, you're using my music staff, why don't you just send the emails through there? And I will do that for some things, but you can't have my music staff send out automatic timed emails. For example, I have a whole, um, and this would be the main reason really, for me, like the most important thing that's in there is the sequence I have set up for new parents in our studio. So they join our studio and then when they're three weeks into lessons, I activate that and it sends an email every two weeks roughly for several months, which gives the parents tips about practice, it um, asks them to reply, you know, just little check-ins, all this automatic stuff. All of this is available, by the way, inside the Vibrant Music Teaching membership. So if you're a member and you're watching this, you can do go download my templates and use them to start your own. Um, that's the course is called Email Templates. Essential Email Templates, that's what it's called. Um, so they're all downloadable there and it's set up in a Google Doc. So you can just, you know, copy the Google Doc and then adjust whatever you want, like change it. It's all in my voice. You know, you may write things differently to me. That's great. Change it. And then I show you in that course as well how to set it up in MailerLite. So you can just have these things set up ahead of time. And that means that every parent gets the same information because the problem I was finding before that was, first of all, it was taking me a lot of time to individually think, oh, you know, John's been in lessons a few weeks. I should really email his mom and make sure practice is going okay. First of all, that takes time to do it every time. It takes a few minutes each time. But second of all, maybe I forget sometimes. And if I maybe forget sometimes, then it's not fair. Because then John might receive that, but James doesn't. And Joanne receives that one, but she doesn't get, you know, another email that I sent to someone else. So to make it fair to everyone, make sure everyone has the same information and the same care, that's why I have those automatic emails. Another option, if you don't want to set up the automatic thing, or in addition to that, is to set up little templates of things you commonly email about. These might be ones that you need to customize a bit, like you need to change some details about them, but you get similar questions a lot or similar requests a lot. And so you can set up a template that gives you a starting point for that. If you're using Gmail, there's already a feature for this built in. They, I think they just call it templates now. Let's double check that. I'm pretty sure it's just called templates. These days it used to be called canned responses. Um, so it's under the three dots, isn't it? <laughs> I've lost it. Someone will tell me. It's one of those things you can't think of when you try to do it, when you're thinking too much. Okay. Um, anyway, yeah, someone could tell me where those templates are, I've lost them for now, but in Gmail there is a way to do it, um, and yeah, it used to be called canned responses, I think it's just called email templates these days. So set that up, or set up a Google Doc, or a regular a Word document, um, if you like, and just copy paste from there, it's really the same difference, it's not any faster, as long as you're able to access that document really fast. It's not that much faster to click around Google to get those templates. But basically what I would advise is this. Don't sit down and try and write, okay, people ask me about makeup lessons a lot. So here's what I want to say with that. That's one way to do it, is to sit down and intentionally write these. The far preferable way in my view is next time you get an email from a parent and you think, just stop to, and think to yourself, 
will anyone ask me something like this ever again? Or has anyone asked me this kind of thing before? And if the answer is yes, compose your email that, to that parent, but then copy it and save it somewhere. And then next time you can draw from that and you can make it more generic over time or fill in details, but it means you have a starting point, right? For the next time. And it means you're not doing any extra work. Your only extra work is copy paste, right? It's not anything beyond that because you're already going to reply to that parent. So now you're just saving that work for next time. You're banking it for next time, right? So there's an enormous amount of time I think that we spend on emails that could be saved. Now, side, right beside that, is communication in general. And while I'm talking about like, oh, we need to save time from doing emails, we need to not spend too much time on our emails, yes, but I do prefer to spend time on emails than any other form of communication. And maybe that's not true for you, maybe you prefer texts, but just get clear on what you do prefer and train your parents to do that. So personally, it would drive me absolutely insane if I had parents Facebook message me and text me and write to me on WhatsApp and whatever other magical forms of communication they come up with, right? Writing to me on Signal and Voxer and here and there and then saying things to me in person and then sometimes calling me. Okay, there's gonna be some variety in our communication, but for the most part, almost everything, almost all of my communication with parents is in email. And that means two things. It means if I'm thinking, hey, did so-and-so write to me? Or did she tell me that information I asked for? I have one place to search. Not five, one. I know where I'm going to look for it. If I search for their name in my email inbox, I'm going to find what they said to me last time. So, that's number one. Number two, the reason I prefer email versus anything else for the mo as much as possible is because it doesn't have to live on my phone. And I don't have my work email on my phone. I have it set up so I can turn it on when I need to check something, but I always immediately turn that off again. I don't get notifications on my phone when people email me to my work email address. And that's really important to me because I work a lot. <laughs> and when I'm not working, I need to not be working. And I'm sure this is true for many of you as well, that if you don't have these kinds of boundaries, you're just going to work all the time. Because even if you just glance at that email and you don't reply, it's in your head and it's going round and round, isn't it? And you're going to solve the problem or remind yourself to do something or whatever. It's going round your head. It's an open loop. And what's really the purpose? Did we achieve anything by reading that email earlier than we otherwise would have? Um, no, we didn't. There's no such thing as a piano teaching emergency. So you don't have to be always accessible in your email. And anyone who expects you to always reply to an email within a few hours, I'm sorry, that's an unrealistic and unnecessary expectation in this modern world we live in. So. Everything goes through your email except last minute things. And I make that very clear to parents. And they really do only text me if it's like, oh, so-and-so is supposed to have her lesson in five minutes, but she's not home from school. So she may be late. I'll keep you up to date, right? That's fine. I don't mind getting a text with that. But they don't text me outside of office hours. They don't text me about something that I don't have to deal with right away. And therefore, yeah, it saves me a lot of unnecessary working time where you're not really working but you're kind of working <laughs> let me know if you resonate with that so one form of communication my preference is email and then set up lots of templates for your email or automatic email messages as well now the last thing i have on my list is assignments and that's come up a lot of times already so lesson notes assignments whatever you want to call them i used to spend a lot more time on these than i do now Okay, and this is something I have the pandemic to thank for. So I used to, I used to create assignments in advance of the lesson digitally and then just adjust them by hand during the lesson. That stage wasn't too bad. I could do all my assignments for the week 
in like between one and two hours. So that was fine. Um, and it was worthwhile doing it because it was really my lesson planning time as well. And I bundled those two together. Before that, I was trying to write assignments during the lesson entirely. And that was a bit of a nightmare. And I think that's what a lot of you are describing in the chat is being distracted from the lesson because you're writing these assignment notes, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. And I do think that's less than ideal. What the pandemic forced me to do was to try out a digital assignment app. The one I was using was Tanara. Those who have been following the piano teacher world and the news in our world will know that Tanara is closing down at the moment. So they are going to close down completely in November. They're kind of in a, hey, get your stuff off our platform before we close down mode right now. So they're not taking new people, but they're still open for those that are already use it. So I started using Tanara because of online lessons and wanting to streamline things because I was exporting those assignment sheets and emailing them to parents. And I thought, hey, we can do better than this. And then I went on to create my own app, which many of you will have heard about by now. It's called Vivid Practice. So I created that because of frustrations I was having with Tanara, which I feel okay saying now that they're closing down anyway. So I'm not like giving out about a brand that's out there. I would never do that. But yeah, they are closing down. So I don't feel bad saying I had certain frustrations with them and they didn't suit me completely. I loved the functionality of having a library of assignments and being able to just pull that into a student's assignment list, already have some notes in there, already have the attachments, all of that stuff. And yeah, it saves me an enormous amount of time on that. So that all exists in Vivid, but it's even more streamlined which is what I'd aim for. So fewer clicks for the teacher, faster ways of working. And some of the things that we're getting in my way in Tanara aren't there. And then some of the features are just different. Like we don't have points and gamifications and leaderboards because personally, I don't believe in those if, for motivating students for practice. Now that's a whole other discussion and one that I'm happy to have again, but there are other videos on the channel already about that. I talked about it with Sam Coates in our interview Samantha Coates in our interview about Vivid Practice um, a couple of weeks ago. Anyway, all that to say, if you're not doing assignments in some kind of a digital way, I would advise you to rethink that. It can save you so much time. So with Vivid, you have a library of assignments and you're just pulling those in. So you set them up once and then the next time you need to assign that particular piece or that scale or whatever, all the notes you've already set up and maybe tracks you've attached or videos you've attached, they're already there. And then you can adjust it to suit that student or change it each week, you know, change the notes about what, how they should practice it, what they should do. But a lot of it is already set up. And it literally takes, I don't know, a couple of minutes, maybe maximum total of lesson time to update the assignments. So it's really very little time for me. And I can do it in between the student doing things. So that's not two minutes where I'm sitting there and they're not doing anything. That's like 10 seconds while they're opening up the, their book or playing a certain piece or whatever, where I can listen and set that up at the same time. So even if you don't want to use Vivid Practice, that's absolutely fine. I'm not here to tell you, you must use it, but find some digital solution that suits you. So whether that's just a Google Doc or whether it's um, My Music Staff, as was mentioned, they have a more simple lesson notes function where you can type in. That's great. Some kind of a digital solution will save you time. The other thing that might save you a bit of time is acknowledging who these notes are for and how they're going to use them. So I wrote an article about this on the Colorful Keys blog. Um, it's right at the top of the blog at the moment. So if you just look for Colourful Keys blog, you'll see it. Um, it's about whether students really read their practice assignments or their lesson notes, whatever you want to call them. So tell me in the chat, do they? Do your students all read their notes? Because I think a lot of us could save time by simply doing less with our notes, but less is more. I'm not saying we shouldn't make notes, and the notes can be for us as well as for them. So when you use something like Vivid Practice or whatever you're using, something digital, 
it means you have access to it automatically, right? So it's not a notebook that you're sending home with students and then you can't see when they're not there. But I want us to think about, are they really using them? And when they are, how are they using them? Are they reading paragraphs of text? Probably not. They might read a few bullet points. So maybe it's better to write less. Maybe it's better to write in their words, right? They think they're mostly for me. Maybe they are mostly for you, Sandra. I'm not trying to be like, pick on you or anything, but maybe they are because a lot of us write them basically as we would to ourselves or as we would to an adult when we're talking to a child. So bullet points, emojis, simple language, their words, you know, if they said staccato was like a trampoline in the lesson, use that, right? Use a picture of a trampoline. It doesn't have to be this beautifully written thing. You shouldn't be trying to prove something about your writing skills in these notes. It has to make sense to them. So I think that's two ways we can save on our lesson notes. Let me know if you disagree with me. That's absolutely fine. Um, I haven't seen any questions come through that I haven't answered, which is totally fine. Write less this year and uh, ask students to explain it back to me instead. Yes, getting students to explain it to you as well is great. But I think when we start writing them in a different way, they're, and yes, reinforce that we want them to read them, etc. But then when they do read them, if they make sense and are helpful, they're more likely to read them again. And often, our students' experience might be that they tried to read them once and couldn't even understand what we were saying. <laughs> and so they gave up. And they were like, these are an adult thing. No matter what she says, you know, I'm going to nod along and say I'll read them, but they're written for adults and I hate reading them. Maybe. Yes, Michelle, I love that as well. I thought about lesson notes a lot this summer and new ideas for effectiveness rather than printing out the assignment sheet. So far, every student asks for the printed version each week. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, I think even if you're doing a printed version, like you said, printed, so it's not like you're handwriting it. A lot of us also type faster than we write, so that saves some time as well. And if you do write very slowly, here's a kind of, um, I don't know, a sideways option. <laughs> Maybe you should take a typing course. Maybe that would save you time. This was a suggestion in a productivity kind of video that I watched recently. And I was like, hey, you know what? That's right. If our typing speed isn't great, we have an enormous amount of time we could save right there with our typing skills. And anyone can learn to type faster. If you don't believe that, then you shouldn't believe anyone can learn to play the piano, right? So I'm sure you're on board with that. We could learn to type faster. Maybe that's the solution. Uh, Maya asked, teen beginners who want to race ahead. In particular, I have a YouTube transfer who plays Rush E reasonably well and is some somewhat dutiful about technical work, but he's a little wigged out by sheet music despite classical love. Okay, wigged out by sheet music. Okay, here's the question. First of all, is he really on board with reading? So if you have a teen student, first of all, you have to assess that. Are they, do they actually want to read? Like really, they want to put in the work to read. Because if they do, most of your work is, is done right there. If they don't, there is no point trying to just bash them over the head with we reading. They won't do it because they're, they're not invested in it. And they have their own, you know, they're independent in that way. They, they, their parent isn't going to sit beside them for the most part, and force them to read music. And they're not going to do something just because you say so. They need to be invested in it. So the first thing is, is he on board with the reading music thing? Um, if he's not, you need to have that conversation, make sure you're open to his ideas, etc. Um, one suggestion, though, if he's a YouTube transfer, is to gradually, gradually show him over time what reading can do. So anytime, 
he is wanting to learn a piece or he's learned a piece from YouTube, you pull up the sheet music and play it because he will see what sight reading skills can do that way. So that's just for those out there who have a teen who's not really invested in the whole reading music thing, demonstrate the skill because it takes so long to learn a piece off YouTube. <laughs> so much longer than just reading it if you have that skill. Now, the second part of that is, <laughs> so he pays lip service and he does great when we take it slow, formulaic music like superstanics, but the earliest pieces are a little dry. Yeah. So part of that is, I think you sound like you're already doing a great balance because you say you're doing rope pieces and chords and stuff. So keep doing that, but have an honest discussion with them. You know, he's 13, so he can understand the facts. Facts are, he can't read yet. Facts are, beginner music is going to sound a little bit babyish. We're going to get through it as fast as we can together. It's not going to sound amazing, but you never have to play it in front of anyone except me. And this is the fastest route to you being able to read the music that you want to be able to read. So just, you know, being really open and honest about the, the facts of the situation, I think can go a long way. Um, a lot of people aren't straight enough with teenagers just saying, like, look, this is what it takes to get to read. I'm going to make it as easy as I can. I'm going to make the music as interesting as I can. But we need to go through about a year, six months to a year, of maybe playing some boring stuff, yeah. But at the end of that, we get to be able to read music that you love, right? So, yeah, hopefully that's helpful. Okay, before we wrap up here, great little chat about admin. So thank you for coming. Before we wrap up, I wanted to do a quick PSA about Vivid Practice for those who've been watching this. Um either tomorrow or the next day, I will have the Tanara import tool ready for you. So if you were using Tanara before and you want to be able to pull all your assignments directly into Vivid Practice, that is coming your way. We did some testing on it today. It's looking fantastic. And I'll have more news about it and a video out in the Facebook group tomorrow. So if you've been wondering about that, if you are one of the Tanara expats, you're someone who has to move away from Tanara, then make sure you're in the Vivid Practice uh, Clubhouse. That's our Facebook group. So you can follow along there. Or if you've already signed up for Vivid Practice, I'll also send out an email about this since it is important for everyone to know. So yeah, that's coming very, very soon. Tomorrow or maybe Friday at the latest. And I'm really looking forward to making your life a little bit easier with that. So I will wrap up there. Um, wait, I'm going to answer one question before we do. Um, 61 key keyboard, better to let students start lessons with that versus not at all. Um, okay, what I do is, if they're otherwise really enthusiastic about lessons and it really they do seem serious about it, I tell them, look, you can start with this, but you have to get a new one within a month. If that's not going to go over well, right, if they're saying we can't possibly afford that, then they would be better waiting six months to start lessons. That's the truth. And it's not always comfortable and we want the students to start right away and we might not have space in six months. But reality is they will be better off with a better instrument. And just making sure that they've understood what that means for their investment. Because piano lessons are so expensive. They are. Like even if, you know, no matter where you are, they're expensive in comparison to most other activities that students do. So saving money on the instrument is not money well saved. They need to invest in a better instrument. But I do say, okay, you can start, but we need to fix that within a month. And then I follow up, you know, every week for the first month saying, oh, here's my um, article with the information about keyboards. Have you picked one yet? I'm happy to look over models if you're considering different ones. Keep following up. I'm pretty persistent about that so that they get, no, she means this. We're really going to fix this right away. So yeah, that's my perspective. Different people have different ways of looking at it, but that's how I think about the whole keyboard thing. Because I've seen the downside. I've seen students, I've had students who started with something unweighted in the beginning for maybe the first year. And the transition then to a weighted instrument has nearly made them quit because it is so tough. So yeah, it's not worth it. Okay, hope that answers your question. Thank you for it. And thank you all for joining. I hope you have a fabulous day ahead. 
and I will see you back here next week. <laughs>